Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this car boot sale is mine, and I'll be explaining, uh, I'll explaining all of that in a minute. Um, uh, I've been told that most people who've, who've, who've talked at this festival have talked knowledgeably about uh, Tagore. I have to confess up front, I know very little about Tagore at all, so I'm not going to try and pretend, other than I think that, uh, that, uh, that, that he would very much approve of what Transition is doing. And uh, I always think when I'm in this, this hall, which is one of the most beautiful spaces that I know, which seems such a celebration of, of what you can do with, with local building materials, uh, that actually that, uh, that what we're trying to do is really about trying to honour that and, and carry a lot of that forward. Um, it's also a dreadful space to uh, show PowerPoint slides. And uh, which has been, which so is why my, what, what I want to try and embody in this talk is that thing of trying to see the move away from high energy ways of doing things to lower energy ways of doing things, not as something terrible and as a, a hindrance, but actually as the thing that, that, that will inspire more creativity uh, and artistry and so on. So, uh, and also I had a mental picture this morning of trying to imagine Tagore doing a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> And it just didn't quite work for me, so I, so I, thought, we'd, I thought we'd try and do something a little bit different today. Um, so I need... Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the slides that I would show, which is the only thing I'm going to show you like this, but could someone just come up and give me a hand? Emily, could you just come up? Okay, this is my first slide which we'll hold up for you at the back. So this is, uh, this is just one of the ways that we sort of frame transition. You know, why do we do transition? Well, partly it's because of this, this whole question of peak oil. And this is just a, a very, very useful, very interesting uh, thing that was produced by the uh, International Energy Agency, who spent the last 20 years saying, peak oil, not an issue, don't worry about it, it's really not a concern, it's doomer, doomer sort of fantasy stuff, frankly. And actually, in their last thing they put out in 2010, a little sentence halfway through that said, the peak in world oil production, which happened in 2006, da 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 So this is, this is supposedly where we're going in terms, of, uh, in terms of oil production in the world here. We're here now. Uh, and reassuringly, the overall line just keeps on rising. Everything's fine. Don't need to worry about it. But actually, this blue bit, which is conventional oil production, which has underpinned everything for the last uh, however many years, uh, is falling precipitously, uh, much more sharply. Every time they bring out a report, the, the angle of that downward slope is more severe. So what actually means that this rut line keeps on rising is firstly this yellow bit, unconventional oil, which is the Alberta tar sands, deep water oil, the stuff where you get much, much less energy out for what you put in. And from a climate perspective, from a social justice perspective, is just disaster, absolute disaster. But the main thing that keeps it buoyed up is this lovely turquoise slice here, oil fields yet to be found, <laughs> which magically just happens to fit the amount that you need to keep that line going up. <laughs> And then this other blue bit here, which is uh, fields yet to be developed. Now, this depends almost entirely on Saudi Arabia, and it relies almost entirely on Iraq as well. Uh, the Iraqi oil industry, uh, the oil, oil um, what are they called? The Iraqi oil ministry have just halved their forecast of what they're going to be producing up until 2017. This depends on us finding four new Saudi Arabias over the next 10 or 15 years. Not happening. So actually, this is a really important time because where we are is on this tipping point between the age that always had more energy available every year to make everything happen to a time when we're going to have less available every year. And that's a profound, a profound shift. Thank you very much to my assistant. There. And alongside that issue is the whole issue of climate change, which I'm sure you're, you're, you're largely familiar with. But Within climate change, you know, that actually this is an issue which is accelerating and accelerating. Last year was the warmest year on record. 19 countries broke their hottest ever temperature record. Pakistan had a day where it was 53.3 degrees. Uh, things that weren't supposed to start happening for a long time are starting to happen. The need to decarbonize, the need to break that addiction to oil which seeps through all aspects of our life, our food, how we house ourselves, how we get around, is incredibly urgent and incredibly imperative. And peak oil and climate change is sometimes referred to as the two great oversights of our times, which I think is a very good way of looking at them. And so in transition, what we try and do is build from that and, and look at what we're going to do about it. And the two things that, that, that emerge as part of that is firstly this idea of resilience. The former Crystal Palace manager Ian Dowie used to refer to resilience as bounce-back ability. 
and actually how do we have the bounce back ability uh, uh, nationally and also in the places that we live. Uh, and at the moment the UK uh, exports 1.2 million kilos of milk and cream to, from France every year and we export 9.9 .9 million. We send 1.5 million kilos of potatoes to Germany every year and at the same time we import 1.5 million kilos of potatoes from Germany. Uh, we send 43,000 scarves to Canada every year and we import 39,000 scarves from Canada. I think a scarf's a scarf, isn't it really, frankly? I've never seen someone say it was Canadian. Uh, and we import 310 million pounds worth of beer and we export 313 million pounds worth of beer. And Herman Daly, the economist, used to say, why don't we just email each other the recipes? <laughs> Actually, I think he said fax each other the recipes then, probably. But so transition is really a movement that says, yeah, why don't we just email each other the recipes, actually? And, uh, and that they, by doing that, uh, we could have a huge sort of upsurge of, of creativity and, and economic brilliance and inventiveness. So, uh, so in transition, there are different aspects to it, I suppose. Firstly, transition, we really see what we've been doing really over the last four years since, as, as John said, we published the Transition Handbook, is we've been running an experiment. And it's been an experiment that started in Ireland and started to, to really move along here in Totnes. And there are now 310, 320 formal transition projects around the world in about 30 different countries. Many, many more at an early stage. We've really lost count and lost contact with actually how many there are because they don't always tell us. They just go off and just get on with stuff. It's been quite extraordinary. And so for me, it, it is an experiment which is out there. And what I want to do is to, is to gather back some of the stories of what people have been doing. It's a simple pr purpose, a simple set of tools. And uh, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, who wrote, the, we just finished off the next transition book, The Transition Companion, which will be out in September. And he wrote the foreword and he said, while always rooted in a set of crucial principles, every example, as in every transition initiative, will reflect the specific needs and qualities of an individual place. It's rather like giving a great cake recipe to a dozen different uh, cooks and watching how their particular ingredients, techniques and creative ideas produce subtly different results. Transition looks different everywhere that it goes. And there are certain things it has, it has in common. I think it's, a, it, it's an inner approach as much as an outer approach. This isn't just purely about solar panels and growing carrots. This is a process about building personal resilience, community resilience for increasingly uncertain times. It's about leading by practical example. It's not about waiting for permission. It's about getting on with it and starting things, as you'll see from what we go on to look at. It's an approach which is rooted in place and circumstance. In Camden, in London, for example, there are about 10 different distinct transition initiatives in the borough of Camden. They're all very different. They have a different feel to them. What they're doing is very different, but it's all recognizably transition, as is the first transition initiative in one of the favelas in Sao Paulo, which had its big launch uh, uh, unleashing event just before Christmas. It's a tool for turning problems into solutions. It's not about going, oh no, what do we, we're finished. It's that, inherent within that is the seeds of what we're going to do. And when we started doing transition here, I thought of this as an environmental thing. This is an environmental initiative. Now, four years on, I really see it as a cultural initiative. It's how do we change the culture of place so that it's more resilient and has more bounce back ability built into it, if you like. It's also an environmental initiative as well, but ultimately I think that that's where we're going. It's also an economic process, which I'll come on to talk about. And I think as much as anything, one of the most powerful things, and maybe this is where, where, my, uh, where my tenuous sort of resonance with, 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 with Tagore comes in, is it's about telling stories. You know, that actually what, what transition groups are doing uh, all over the place is doing things which are really powerful, dynamic stories. And what I've tried to do here in my car boot sale uh, presentation is to try and tell some of those stories. So where this all came from was uh, uh, I was re uh, reading uh, Asterix book with my son. We read Asterix and the Banquet. Has anybody ever, ever read Asterix and the Banquet? So in Asterix and the Banquet, what happens basically, Asterix and Obelix, the Gauls, and the Roman, Julius Caesar uh, uh, lays siege to the village, and he builds a huge big fence around the village, and he says, ha, if you Gauls are so amazing, you try and get out of it, you try and get out of here, I've had enough of you, you're such a nightmare, you lot, I'm just going to nail you all in, and I don't care what happens to you. And the Gauls say, all right then, well you do that, but actually we're going to break out, and we're going to go on a tour around Gaul, and we're going to get a speciality food from every bit of Gaul that we go to, and then we're going to invite you to a banquet, and you can, uh, and, and you can try all of the things, and which, which they do. So what I did was I, uh, as part of writing the Transition Companion, have been gathering these sort of transition in action stories from all around the country. 
And uh, I wrote to a lot of those people and said, I'm doing this talk at the Tagore Festival. I'm not going to use PowerPoint. I'm going to do something a little bit more uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And could you send me something which represents what you're doing? So what we have here is, you know, we've had that Radio Force program around uh, History of the World in 100 Objects. This is really, uh, <laughs> this is a, a history of transition in 20 objects kind of thing. So uh, we start off down here. So I can move around. This is great. So uh, what we've done as in working through the book is to identify maybe five different stages that transition goes through. And the first one we call fairly unimaginatively starting out. And it's that, and it's that bit when, when a group of people come together and they say, we should do, let's do transition, let's do something. Maybe they might meet in a pub, they might be a group that already exists, but they decide, uh, let's do something. And, uh, and so the first bit of the process is really about awareness raising, trying to trigger something interesting happening. So this is, uh, and I appreciate it's a big hall. Some of these things are very big and some of them are very small. So, but you can come up and look at all these things afterwards if you want. This is from uh, Chepstow. This is Transition Chepstow. This is the, the cloth bag that, that Transition Chepstow produced. Lots of places have done uh, cloth bags. They got their local shops to promise to reduce the amount of plastic bags. In exchange, they got given these cloth bags. They held a competition with the local, worked with the local newspaper, built a very good relationship with them. So every fortnight, if you were the person photographed shopping in Chepstow with your Chepstow bag, you won a prize. Uh, but it was a really great awareness raising tool for starting to get transition Chepstow out there and visible and, uh, and unseen. Now this rather, rather revolting sweater, which was <laughs> sent to me in a, in a package from Taunton. See, it's been a heady couple of weeks. The postman, every time the postman comes, my family sort of uh, look a little bit weary and I get rather excited. So, so Transition Town Taunton have done some really extraordinary stuff over the last couple of years of working with their local council. They saw that connection with their council as a really, really important part of what they were doing from early on. And in July 2009, they did a process with, with their local council where, where all 375 people who worked for the local council uh, spent, met four or five times and did a whole kind of visioning piece. So this was from the chief executive officer down to the, down to the car park attendants and the, and, and the guys who cut the grass. And they spent, a whole, uh, they spent all this time looking at what's this area going to look like in a, in a peak oil climate change world. What's a resilient Taunton Dean going to look like? and it was very visionary, very bold, led to a very good report called Towards a Resilient, uh, uh, Towards a Resilient Taunton Dean, which you can find online. But what it did was it brought all those people together to, to, to be brilliant together and to dream together. And uh, it led to all kinds of things within the council. They now have a green champions team. Uh, and one of the things that came out of that was one of the senior planning officers got together with a car park attendant and they decided, let's create an, a community orchard in the town. So they got together and they've planted an orchard uh, and then the transition group have been, have been running lots of workshops with the council. Uh, each department now has an energy charter, they've cut electricity use within the council by 14%, they have a car club, uh, they have fuel efficient driving lessons for all the staff. What's that got to do with that horrible sweater you're all thinking? Well they, did a, uh, they had a day that was called uh, turn the heat down. So that day in their offices they turned all the heating down in the office and all the staff were invited to go and buy the most revolting jumper they could find to wear a jumper to work and prizes were given out for the most appalling sweater people wore to work uh, and it enabled them to, to, to bring the heat down. And Chrissy Godfrey, who was from that transition group, she said, she said that, uh, that they see their main role as being uh, to keep telling the council how brilliant they are and to keep it high on the political agenda too. Just goes to show how powerful a catalyst to transitioners in the right place at the right time can be. This is uh, Gertie. This is Bertie. And this, I assume, is one of their eggs. Her eggs, presumably. Uh, so Bertie and Gertie were made uh, in Tooting in London for the uh, Transition Town Tooting Trash Catchers Carnival, which happened last summer and was the most extraordinary event. They worked with Project Pakama and Emergency Exit Arts, and uh, they came to us quite early on and said, how do we do transition in Tooting? It was one of the most diverse parts of London, high social deprivation indices and so on. And we said, I've, I've got absolutely no idea. I don't know. And, uh, and uh, you know, you figure it out. And so they did. So they went away and uh, they were the first transition project to get Arts Council funding. And uh, the, the Trash Catchers Carnival was, was a street carnival. 
It involved the local mosques, the local schools, the local temples. There were over a thousand people involved in making props and making things. Everything was made out of reused, recycled materials. They used about a million old plastic bags. They had uh, several uh, big things that were about the six meters high, about the size of a house. Uh, and in order to do it, in order to run the carnival, they needed to block off Tooting High Street. Tooting High Street is the most busy road in London. Transport for London, it's a red route in London. Transport for London said there's absolutely no way you're going to be able to block off Tooting High Street. Not going to happen. By this time, they had all the local schools. They had all these kids who'd made these six foot high, six meter high figures and carnival processions out of all this stuff. Uh, and they said, actually, no, we're not going to take that. Actually, this carnival has to go ahead because that's what this community wants to happen. Look at all the love and care people have put into all this stuff. And um, so they went to uh, the, the local police. The, the, the local council said, uh, well, no, we're not going to really support you to do this either. Uh, so they went to the local police and they had to declare their intention to march, to protest. And in the little box they said, what are you protesting against? They said, absolutely nothing. Uh, and, uh, and then with about two weeks to go, uh, the, the, council, the, 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 the council, in their final kind of, you're not going to do this, all right, said, all right, well, then, if you're going to do it, then you're going to have to pay the policing bill. It's about £50,000. Have you got £50,000 to pay for the policing? So they went back to the local police and talked to them, and about three days before, when everything was ready to go, the head of the local police said, uh, we'll pay for the policing out of our community, uh, community working with the community budget. Um, and like this was after a local headmistress had said, no, actually this has to happen because uh, this has to be visible and significant for the local community. At the end of the carnival, when they'd gone down Tooting High Street, you'll find films on YouTube about it, they got to a local park and local restaurants uh, donated enough food to feed a thousand people uh, in the park and they were nominated for, one of the, uh, for, for a Climate Week award. So this is Bertie and Gertie who were made by the local Lido. Uh, Tooting Beck Lido, uh, and this was one of their, their, their contributions to that. And I also have, uh, this was one of the way that they promoted uh, the thing, and they've sent one of these for, for everybody here. So this is a little thing about, uh, I don't, hopefully there'll be enough, if you want to take them and pass them along. Um, uh, so that was one of the ways that they promoted it, with packets of seeds, and, it, and it, was, it was such an exciting drama. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Um, this is something which uh, our friend Jan is here from, uh, from, from Sweden. And transition, there's lots of transition stuff happening in Sweden. And this is something which he gave us yesterday, which I thought was really lovely. This is a newspaper of stories from the future from a powered down future. It's one of the things that transition groups do a lot in their early stages is, you know, well, what would it be like? You know, if we're talking about a lower energy future, what would it smell like, sound like, feel like? You know, tell the stories. And my favorite in, in, in here, I think is lovely, is there's one story which is called, the title of, of it is, The Last Commuter. <laughs> what a lovely story. Who is the last commuter? Why was he the last one? What was everybody else doing at that point? Uh, and they have this lovely, on, on the front cover, what does that mean again? Pea oh, P becomes gold. So this is a story about a woman whose, whose business was collecting urine. By that stage, nitrogen for agriculture is very, very expensive. So she became very, very wealthy running a business. Here she is with barrels of urine behind her. <laughs> so that's that first stage, which is really about getting started. It's very, it's very uh, vibrant and impulsive and creative, and it just gets things going at an early stage. So the second is, is deepening. So deepening is by this stage, you've got things underway, uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of people, you've got a bit of a buzz going, you want to kind of take the whole process deeper. So one of the things, um, this, is, uh, this beautiful, beautiful tree here is a, uh, uh, a Juglans Proslavsky. It's a Bulgarian walnut variety. And I love walnut trees. Uh, and uh, I'm a great believer that walnut trees will be one of the things that will, will save the world. You can produce as much protein and carbohydrate a hectare with hybrid walnuts as you can with organically grown wheat. We have one of the world authorities on agroforestry living here in, in Totnes with Martin Crawford. And uh, so lots of places now are starting to look at, it's only really been in the last 30, 40 years we've perfected the art of making our urban landscapes completely useless. And we specifically breed totally useless plants to plant them up with. Ground cover shrubs, we call them usually. And, uh, um, 
So one of the things that we do here in, in Totnes is the, the nut tree planting scheme. We've planted nearly 200 nut trees now through, through Totnes in, in different places where they're planted. People who live nearby uh, become the guardians of those trees, look after them as, as they grow and so on. And this is something we're seeing happening in lots of other places as well. And it gets away from that idea that, well, what does a low-carbon future look like? Well, it looks like sort of Buck Rogers with solar panels and people flying around on hoverboards. And actually, it's going to look largely like it looks now, but with different stuff in and around what we've already got. You know, 80% of the houses we'll have in 2050, we already have. But we can have walnut trees and almond trees. We had our first harvest of almond, uh, almonds in a park in Bridgetown last year, which was very, very exciting. Uh, this beautiful, beautiful object here, and uh, we would have had, we, the, 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 the team here from, from Malvern, from Transition Malvern Hills, who lovingly bought this beautiful lamp down from, from Malvern today, uh, and uh, we were going to light it, but we're not allowed to, because we didn't tell Dartington sufficiently in advance. But this is a really, really lovely story, and um, uh, those of you who've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the lamps... Uh, the lamp that Lucy finds when she goes through into Narnia uh, is based on the ones in Malvern. When C.S. Lewis was at college there, or he taught there, or there was some connection with C.S. Lewis there. And so he wrote about these lamps. So there's 109 of these old Victorian uh, gas lamps throughout Malvern which are listed uh, and uh, they're very much a part of the story of the place. But they're incredibly inefficient. So they cost at the moment the council £40,000 a year to maintain and they cost about uh, 14,000 uh, pounds in gas every year. So that's 130 pounds each lamp every year in gas, 450 pounds maintenance. People have to go around and look after them all the time. Transition Malvern Hills, the energy group, the, the, the lighting group in that said, that's ridiculous. Actually, we can do better than that. So what they've done is that they've brought together a team of people, not just within Malvern, but internationally, who are experts on gas lamps, on this whole technology, and they've made over these lamps and they've brought it down now so that they actually have, they've cut the carbon emissions by 84% from these lamps. They're 10 times brighter than they were before. And the group within, uh, the, within Transition Malvern who do that are known as the Gasketeers. Uh, and there are 11 of them. There are three of them here today. So if anybody wants to find out more about these lamps, then just put your hands up, give, give a wave. So this is one of 14 lamps that are being, that are being restored and will be put in place. Uh, they now are as energy efficient as the current lighting, so they're now as efficient as sodium lighting or, or LED street lighting. What they're working on now is anaerobic digestion. So these can run, they can run the gas lamps off the waste from the town uh, in such a way that, uh, that, that it's actually kind of carbon neutral process. These lamps also are designed to last 100 years. The conventional lights last 30 years and then they're thrown away. Uh, and they also don't make any light pollution. They're designed in such a way that all the light goes down. It doesn't go up into light in the sky as so much of our lighting does. Um, and at this point I would have gone and now cha -ching, and it would all lit up but you have to imagine that bit this is uh, um, from the Forest of Dean this is Transition Newant so Transition Newant have been working very very closely with their local secondary school and helped them to set up a GCSE in ELBS which is something land based studies uh, and so the Transition Group bought a big polytunnel for the school and have, been, and have been supporting that process of young people learning to grow food. So this is that they sent. This is their to-do list uh, from from inside the the, the, the tunnel. Uh, some things I've had to kind of make up in terms of props because actually this is in in forest. This is an egg. They they said actually, why don't you just get an egg? <laughs> it could all go quite horribly wrong if if we actually try and send you an egg in the post. So this is not an egg from Forres in Scotland, but you can try and imagine that it is. So uh, in Forres, Transition Town Forres, they decided, okay, we, we really want to start putting some food security back into this place. We want to get some land back into community ownership so that we can start to grow food, people get people to grow food again. So, they, so they, they, they've got two acre site from the local council and uh, they have 75 people now gardening on this site. Rather than in the traditional way of doing allotments, dividing it up into rectangles, they divide it up into circles which they call pods. So people work in a circular uh, space. Uh, 
They've got a polytunnel, they've got 15 children working there regularly, they work with the local scouts, there's 60 local scouts who are regularly involved with it. They have 26 chickens, hence the eggs, and they're now planning a farmer's market which will, which will be linked into the garden as well. And they only have a 20% rate of people who, who, who do it for a while and then don't, don't do it, as opposed to much higher in, in, in conventional allotment approaches. This honey is from Dorset, from Transition Dorchester, who are a very, very active group down there. And uh, they, again, decided, we want to we, we start doing some food growing projects. So they got on Google Earth, and they looked all around Dorchester, and they looked for the places where, where they might uh, set up some kind of a food growing project. And they found that actually most of them were owned by the Duchy of Cornwall. So they went to visit the Duchy of Cornwall, said we want some land to grow some food on, and the Duchy said, OK, well, there's two acres over here. You can have it for five years and uh, 200 pounds a year. And it's called Underlanch Farm. And one of the first things they've, they've been producing is their own honey, starting to teach people how to, how, how to keep bees, starting to grow food and so on. Uh, and they did send me a really terrible joke as well, which was uh, uh, there's a duck and a chicken standing by the road. And the duck says, I think I'm going to cross the road. Chicken says, I wouldn't do that. I did it once. I haven't lived it down since. <laughs> um, I apologize for that. That was terrible. Uh, so, so that's in Dorchester. And this is, this is what's happened with doing this process of asking places to send stuff, is some of them have been just incredibly lo loving with it and attentive to detail. This you might not be able to see from the back. But this is, uh, this is from Belsize in London. This is a little door and, uh, and a little sash window. And uh, here's a little person whose name is Patrick, draft-proofing the little door. And this is uh, Lauren and Sarah, who are draft-proofing this little uh, sash window. So, uh, so this, is a, this is from a project in Belsize, which started uh, elsewhere in, in the south of London, uh, which is uh, called Draft Busters. And Draft Busters is something which a lot of the London transition groups uh, are, are really uh, moving very fast on. So they're working with Camden County Council, who, who were trying to get people to do energy efficiency stuff in their house, was quite slow, was, was, was taking a while to take off. So what they do is, is uh, it, you run it in people's houses. So whoever hosts it gets 50 pounds worth of, uh, of, of draft proofing stuff. It's in buildings that have sash windows, casement windows, those kind of Victorian houses. So if you host it, you get 50 pounds worth of stuff. If you attend, you get 20 pounds worth of stuff. 15 people come along, you learn how to do it. Uh, everybody has a go at doing it, so you all feel really familiar with it. And then, uh, and then you, you go off and do your own houses. It's now starting to grow into a bit of a social enterprise where they actually do it for other people. Um, and uh, uh, they've also done it with 15 local schools where they've draft-proofed the local schools as well. And so it's happening now in lots of different transition groups. So what we're seeing is that lots of transition projects almost act like research and development units. One of them tries something out, this works really well, and then it spreads out through, through a lot of different ones. A bit like the garden share scheme that we have here in Totnes that's like a dating agency that matches people who want to grow food with people who, who, who have a garden they, they aren't using anymore. So then the third kind of stage that we start to see happening is what we call connecting, which is about how do we make this go deeper and really, really embed this uh, in this place. So this is a, a clove of a bulb of garlic from uh, Slathwaite in Yorkshire. And uh, the local uh, shop there, so there's a group called Transition Marsden and Slathwaite, or MAST for short, and uh, they, uh, they've been going for a little while and doing all kinds of things. And um, the, the local greengrocer was going out of business. And they thought, well, we don't want to lose the local greengrocer. It's a really important part of this community. Maybe we could, maybe we could do something. So uh, they decided, well, something like that's only really going to work if the community gets behind it and if the community supports it. So they, they held a big meeting. How about a community takeover of this shop? People were very, very enthusiastic. Uh, so they decided, OK, we'll have another meeting in three weeks' time, and we'll come back with you with a very concrete proposal. They went away. They set up an industrial and providence society to support that and to make that happen. And then three weeks later, they launched a share option where people could buy shares uh, in the shop. Uh, and uh, they, they said, OK, we want to raise £15,000 in 10 days, or this isn't going to happen. And you can buy shares from, from £20 up to... £10,000, and within 10 days they sold £15,000 worth of shares. 
and then lots of volunteers came, helped, they did the shop over, they got a local bakery, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, uh, they got involved, uh, it cost actually less than £10,000 because there were so many volunteers to make the shop over, the shop is now running. And they see that shop as a really important catalyst for, for local food in, in the area. So the reason they sent me this clove of garlic was one of the first things they decided to do was to hold the, uh, the Slathwaite Garlic Challenge. Because they found when they started to run their shop, that when you run a shop and you sell garlic, most of that garlic comes from China. And they said, that's just daft, we grow good garlic here. So they bought in some garlic and everybody who came in the shop would get given a few uh, uh, cloves of garlic and told, go and plant this garlic and we'll buy it back off you for the shop. So the idea is for Slathwaite to be self-sufficient in garlic within a year or two. <laughs> and then Marsden and Slathwaite Transition Town uh, have launched a, a, a cooperative called uh, Edibles, which is, which is going to support that and, and supply produce for, for the shop. So coming back to top mess now, let's just keep an eye on the time, how are we doing? Oh my God, okay, Jesus, I need to hurry up. Huh? Oh, leave time for questions too. Oh my God. Okay. Transition Town Totnes. This is a map which has red dots. Every one of those dots is a Transition Together group. Transition Together is something that we set up here, which is about people getting out on their street, uh, linking up with, the, with, with their neighbours, forming a group. They work through, um, they work through a, a, a workbook that we've done where the first week you talk about energy, second week you talk about food and so on. Uh, there are now 500 households in Totnes who've gone through uh, this and on average they cut their carbon by one and a half tons each. But when you meet people in the street who've been part of that project, they don't say, hey, it's great, I did transition streets, I saved 1.5 tons of carbon. They say, it's great, I now know Dave down the end of the road, he's fantastic, we do this together, we're starting uh, this, that and the other. It's been a real catalyst for all kinds of things. So then the next stage is really about building, and I think this is where we start to kind of really, where transition, what's, what's distinct to transition, really starts to pick up, which is saying, if we're actually serious about localization here, and we actually see the future of this place as coming from that process, and increasingly we start to argue that economic localization is economic development. It should be a key strand of how a place looks at its future economic development. Then we need to start putting certain things into place, because it's not going to happen by accident. So this is from uh, Edinburgh, this is in Portobello in Edinburgh. They set up a local market, a local farmer's market where there wasn't one before. This is their Porty Shopper bag, which is about promoting the idea of the area, but also links in with, with, with the market. Uh, this apple is a slightly disappointing representation of the from the ground up uh, food co-op in Kingston who are going to send me a box of the vegetables. They do their vegetable box scheme, but it didn't quite arrive in time. So they said, use an apple. So this apple represents a big vegetable box full of stuff. But they started, that emerged in London from Transition Town, Kingston, and uh, it uh, started in March 2010, and it's a vegetable box scheme because people in that area were struggling to get access to good quality organic food. They have two places where people go and pick up their boxes, they now sell bread and cheese as well. And they're, again, trying to link that in to starting all kinds of market gardens in and around Kingston. And in terms of economics, there's th this idea that we see uh, our local economies as being like a leaky bucket that money just pours out through the holes of all over the place. Everywhere where money pours out through one of those holes is a potential local business, potential local livelihood. So different transition projects have been experimenting with the idea of local currency as money that can't leave through the holes because it's not worth anything. This is our Totnes Pound, the experiment we've been running here in Totnes, which has inspired various other places such as uh, Lewis. Uh, these are Lewis Pounds. You're welcome to come up and have a look at these afterwards. You can spend these in over 100 shops now in Lewis. And they have their own 21 pound note. Because who's going to say, you can't do that? Really? I think you'll find we can, actually. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Brixton. This is the Brixton Pound, which, is, uh, which you can uh, buy things in, all in that district of London, experimenting on, a, on an urban scale. Very interesting. This is an Italian currency, which I can't even remember what it's called. SEC, I think. Uh, and also Transition Network is now working together with New Economics Foundation to, to look at what uh, local currencies that you use from your phone look like. In terms of places working with their local councils, uh, one of the most exciting things recently, they, I feel like I should be at the beginning of a football match with this thing. So what they give, the captains give each other. This is from Montevelio in Bologna in Italy, the Comune di Montevelio. And last year, the Comune di Montevelio passed the most amazing resolution, which is in Italian here. If anyone who can read Italian, come and have a look. But they'd been working from quite early on with, their, with Transition Montevelio. 
And, uh, and what was created out of it was really quite extraordinary. And I just wanted to read just a little bit out of, their, uh, out of the resolution. So it said, uh, one of the things was that it committed the council to promoting the benefits of a more frugal and sustainable lifestyle. And uh, it said, the strateg our strategic partnership with Transition Montevelio, with whom this administration shares a view of the future, the depletion of energy resources, and the significance of limits to economic development, Methods, bottoms up, bottom up commu community participation. Objectives, to make our community more resilient, i.e. prepared for a low energy future. And an optimistic approach, although the times are hard, changes to come will include great opportunities to improve the whole community's quality of life. That's one to just run past your local council <laughs> and see if we can add in. Uh, and also in Nottingham, they passed a resolution. So, so Nottingham Council passed a resolution about peak oil and that's led on to all kinds of stuff happening there. One of the things that we need is ways, I think, of getting young people into business without uh, becoming enormously in debt with the banks. And this little humble loaf of bread here from, from Yorkshire is from a company called The Handmade Bakery. Handmade Bakery started by a couple, a young couple with a, with a small child who wanted to start a bakery. And uh, this is their Yorkshire leaven loaf. They were inspired by Andrew Whitley's Real Bread campaign. This is made with Yorkshire flour, uh, grown very close to where the bakery is. What's special about them, I think, is that when they started, they were a subscription-based bakery. So people became a member. They paid up front for their bread. And when they wanted to expand the business uh, a few months ago, they... Um, Rather than going to the bank and trying to borrow money, they asked all of their members, all of their subscribers to lend them money, said, we'll pay you 7% interest on your loan. Very attractive, hard to get these days. We'll pay you it in bread. So you get your interest in bread, which costs them 2%. So everybody wins, and it means these kind of businesses can, can get going. Uh, in Topsham, in Devon, uh, they started the transition group. They've been doing all kinds of stuff around local food, or, you know, peak oil, climate change. They said, what do we think is the thing that really unites people in this community? Is it peak oil? Is that the thing they're all really concerned about? Is it climate change? No, I don't think so. Maybe it's beer. That's the one. <laughs> That's the thing that people, brings people together. And they started Topsham Ales. So this is Topsham Ales, which is an initiative of, of, of Transition Topsham. And uh, they, uh, they decided that they wanted to start this brewery. They sell shares of £500 each. They have a local brewer who, who wanted to get involved. This is uh, a share certificate from, from Transition Topsham. And uh, they, have, uh, they sold again all the shares very, very quickly. Um, and their tips were that you involve the community as early and as much as you can. You create a good business plan and you dare to be different and you dare to be exciting. And that's what really brings the buzz to what they're doing. So then the, the last one of these is, is in Norwich. I think what, what Transition tries to do as well is to be really strategic about this. So it's not just about starting lots of little random projects. Over time, it's about starting to look at these things in a more strategic context. So in Norwich, Transition Norwich did a study called Can Norwich Feed Itself? I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm nearly there. Transition Town Kingston did a study called Can, Can Norwich Feed Itself? which looked at the city in its context and all that it could grow there. They sent me something which, when I opened the post, was rather alarming. I thought this was some Norwich sort of recycling scheme where they send all their dog mess to Totnes to get rid of it. But this is actually soil from the site. So what they've done is they did this study, and then they're looking at um, uh, creating two new market gardens, setting up a new mill, starting to put in place some of the infrastructure that local food economy would need. And then the last one I really wanted to, to, to mention to you is, is uh, the, the last stage is around, we call it daring to dream, which is where might all this go? What would it look like if actually every town in this country was, was doing this and seeing localization as, its, uh, as the future of its economic development and applying this kind of approach? And in Lewis, they're just doing a, uh, they're just doing a, um, a process to set up the first community power station in the country, solar power station on the roof of Harvey's Brewery, biggest local employer, big brewery. And uh, this is a hard hat which they sent from, from the site where they're going to install the PV panels, 740 PV panels on the roof of the brewery. They've just run uh, a community share option to raise £307,000. It finishes on Monday. I think they're about 10 grand short. Uh, and the local brewery, Harvey's, have brewed a special commemorative beer called Sunshine Ale uh, to celebrate that. Uh, and I think these... I think... Uh, um, that, that put together what we're starting to see in transition is something very, very exciting, a kind of a bottom-up response which is playful, which is creative. And so I just want to close with, a, with one of my favourite um, quotes, which I think uh, describes transition and this model and this approach better than anything I've read in any learned academic books, which is from a book called Comet in Moominland 
which uh, was written in 1946 and which I've been reading with my eight-year-old son recently. And it says, it was a funny little path, winding here and there, dashing off in different directions, and sometimes even tying a knot in itself from sheer joy. You don't get tired of a path like that, and I'm not sure that it doesn't get you home quicker in the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>